entire family, congratulations. Have a wonderful time. Joseph asked me to fill in today and partners, I want to let you know how much Joseph and Heather love you. Because of you, they're able to do what they do and be able to reach the ends of the earth with the word that God has put in Joseph's heart. So partners, thank you, thank you, thank you for being you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. You mean so much to Joseph and Heather. Once again, I'm Carrick Butler. I'm filling in for Joseph's today. So welcome to Prophecy Live. However you're watching, I want to encourage you to share because I believe that something good is going to happen to you today. So expect miracles. I believe that no matter where you're watching, the power of God is going to flow through the screen and minister to you. I believe there'll be healings today, miracles. God was going to encourage you and God is going to speak a word to you you. So before we get into the word today, let's pray. Father, I thank you for every single person under the sound of my voice. I thank you that you have ordained for them at this moment to be wherever they are listening to this word. So I pray that you grant them ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to receive, know and understand what you'll say to them today. Father, I need your help. I only want to say what I hear you say. I only want to do what I see you do so that Jesus may be glorified, lift high, may famous in our lives. As always, Holy Spirit, have your way. Move through every single screen. Move through every single device. Touch every single heart. Let no one leave this time the same. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise for what will happen today and as a result of today. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Once again, welcome. Something good is going to happen to you this morning. I'm Carrick Butler. I'm filling in for Joseph Z. And it's such an honor to be a part. Joseph, thank you so much for entrusting this responsibility to me today as you guys get ready to celebrate your daughter's wedding. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, as we turn there, I want to tell you how much I appreciate Joseph and Heather and the words that Joseph has spoken to my life in his ministry and his books. They are such a blessing. And I know that if you're watching this broadcast, that Joseph has meant a lot to you. Joseph and Heather has meant a lot to you. So go ahead and comment and say, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for being obedient to the spirit of God. Thank you for letting God use you. Go ahead, put it in the chat. If you're watching a place where there's a chat option, go ahead and share how grateful you are for the ministry gifts of Joseph and Heather Z. I know my wife and I are grateful for them and we're so grateful to know them, to have been a part just even for a few years of what God's been doing in their lives and they've poured into us. We're so grateful for them. And once again, I'm honored to have this opportunity to share with you today. Luke chapter 18. I'm going to start with verse two and it says, then he, Jesus, spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose Heart. So the whole purpose of this parable is that we keep praying and we don't give up in prayer. The whole purpose of this parable is that we keep praying and we don't give up in prayer. So go ahead and put it. I'm going to give you all my notes. All my notes can be found at CarrickButler.com. I'm going to give you all my notes for today. But as we go through this message, I'm going to have you talk back to me. I'm going to have you put stuff in the chat. But you say, well, why? Keep listening. You understand why it's so important that you stay engaged with today's message. So the whole purpose of this parable is that we keep praying and we don't give up in prayer. Jesus said there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. And he says, now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But after he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, verse 7 and 8 in the Amplified Classic Version says it this way, and will not our just God defend and protect and avenge his elect his chosen ones who cry to him day and night, will he defer them and delay help on their behalf? I tell you, he will defend and protect and avenge them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find persistence in faith on the earth? I love this parable, especially when I'm teaching on faith or prayer. It's such a wonderful parable of Jesus. But notice something that Jesus is looking for when he comes back. He's looking for persistence in faith or persistent faith. So out of the people who live in the end times, and you know we live in the end times, it doesn't take much revelation to understand that we are in the end 
times. We can look at everything going around us and we go, yeah, we are definitely in the end times. Well, if Jesus is looking for something in the end times, I don't know about you, but I want to make sure I have what Jesus is looking for. If you want what Jesus is looking for, go ahead and put in the chat. I do. I want what Jesus is looking for. I want to be who he's looking for. If that's you, go ahead and put in the chat. Say, that's me. I want to have what Jesus is looking for. I want to be who he's looking for. Because in these last days, Jesus is looking for persistence in faith. Not just a little bit of faith on Sunday morning. Not just a little bit of faith when you feel spiritual. He's looking for persistent faith. Remember, faith is more than a moment. Faith is more than a movement. Faith is a lifestyle, and it is a lifestyle that pleases God. So, well, how do you know that, Carrie? Well, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. It says it four different times. The just shall live by faith. So faith is more than a moment. Faith is more than a movement. It is a lifestyle. And as Hebrews 11 teaches us, it is the lifestyle that pleases God. It pleases God so much that Jesus is looking for persistent faith in the earth. And today I want to share with you how to develop the faith that Jesus is looking for. Because it's more than a moment. It's more than a movement. It is a lifestyle. It's the lifestyle that pleases God and is what Jesus is looking for. So let's define some terms. Faith is belief, confidence, conviction of the truth, belief with the predominant idea of trust. I have a lot of notes for you today. Faith is belief, confidence, conviction of the truth, belief with the predominant idea of trust. One more time. Faith is belief, it's confidence, it's conviction of the truth, it's belief with the predominant idea of trust. And once again, you can find all my notes at carrickbutler.com. So persistent faith is the faith that Jesus is looking for in believers who live in the end times. One of the things I want you to know about persistent faith is that persistent faith always brings the manifestation of God's power. You might say, well, how do you know that? Well, it's your job to supply the faith and it's God's job to supply the power. It's your job to supply the faith and it's God's job to supply the power. Go ahead, say out loud, put it in the chat. Say, it's my job to supply the faith, but it's God's job to supply the power. Come on, say out loud, put it in the chat. Say, it's my job to supply the faith, but it's God's job to supply the power. Come on, say out loud, put it in the chat. Say, it's my job to supply the faith, but it's God's job to supply the power. God will always meet your faith with his power. God will always meet your faith with his power. So faith is belief, confidence, conviction of the truth, belief with the predominant idea of trust. Well, if Jesus is looking for faith, we should go, well, where do we get faith from? Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith doesn't come from what you have heard. Faith is continually moving. I'll say it again. Faith is continually moving moving. And so when you put yourself in position to hear the word, whether it's on Sunday at church, whether it's tuning into wonderful broadcasts like these, whether it's you getting in the word, studying the word, believing the promises of God, reading the word aloud, anytime you do those things, faith is coming to your heart. So that means you always want to keep yourself in a position to hear the word of God. It's not enough in these times just to hear the word on Sundays. You need broadcasts and podcasts like this one. You need to be in the word for yourself every single day. You need to read the word every single day. You know, I encourage my congregation, at least read one chapter aloud every single day. Say, so why do you say to read it aloud? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But also when you look at Joshua chapter one, verse eight, when it talks, tells Joshua to meditate on these things, that word meditate, yes, means to think. It means to imagine, but also means to say. So what God told Joshua to do is to read this law that contained all the plans and the purposes that God had for Joshua's life and the goals for the promised land. He says, read it, think about it, imagine it, and speak it out loud. Why? When you speak the word out loud, faith comes to your heart and it helps you renew your mind. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So now when you hear the word, faith comes to your heart. But just because faith is there doesn't mean, oh, I'm done. I heard the word. Faith is in my heart. I'm good. No. Now that you've heard the word, faith has come to your heart. You must make another decision. Go with me to Mark chapter four. Let's look at another parable of Jesus. When you hear the word, you must make a decision to believe the word. 
When you hear the word, you must make a decision to believe the word. One more time. When you hear the word, you must make a decision to believe the word. Go with me to Mark chapter four. We're going to pick up with verse three. For those of you just tuning in, I'm Carrick Butler. I'm filling in for Joseph Z this week. They're preparing to celebrate their daughter's wedding. And so Joseph and Heather love you guys so much. And partners, we're so grateful for you because of you. We're able to do everything that God has called us to do in this ministry and train up people to hear the word of God and go forth and do what God has called them to do. So go to Mark chapter four, verse three. Look what Jesus says here. He says, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away and some seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some 30 fold, some 60 and some 100. And he, Jesus, said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And go to verse 14. He begins to interpret the parable. Verse 14 says, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And when they have no root in themselves, so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution or affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble or they are offended. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns that those who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires or the lust for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it and bear fruit, some 30 fold, some 60 and some 100. Now, when you hear the word, you must make a decision to believe the word, and then you must make a decision to receive the word. So Jesus tells this parable about all this parable about people who hear the word of God and the conditions of their hearts when they hear the word. So the first group, when they hear the word, they don't receive it. They don't believe it. They reject it. And immediately Satan comes to steal the word. So notice who's after the word. Satan, he's after stealing the word of God because one word from God can change your life forever. And if you don't receive it, which means you don't take it, you don't grab it, you don't hold on to it, he's able to take it away so that word doesn't produce in your life. But then he talks about another group of people who it says they have no depth of earth, so they hear the word, they get excited about the word, they believe it, they receive it, they shout about it. That's what it says in the parable. That's what it means. They receive it with gladness. It means they received it with a shout. They received it with praise and it began to produce. So if you want God's word to work for you, then you need to get happy and excited about what God has told you. That will cause immediate production. But you have to make a decision to hold on to that word because what did happen next? It said affliction and persecution. And Jesus' parable, he compares it to the scorching sun in the Middle East. That's what he's comparing it to. Affliction and persecution. Well, what is affliction or tribulation? Affliction or tribulation is pressure brought by circumstance. Once again, all my notes are found at CarrickButler.com. Affliction or tribulation is pressure brought by circumstance. What is persecution? Persecution is pressure brought by people. Affliction is pressure brought by circumstance. Persecution is pressure brought by people. And we all know there, there are different levels of pressure. Some is light. Some is intense. Some is dangerous. There are always different levels of pressure, no matter if it's coming from people or circumstance. And so what is Satan's first two tactics? He lists all five tactics here. The first two are affliction and persecution. Go ahead and put in the chat. Say his first two tactics are affliction and persecution. Go ahead, put out, put in the chat. Affliction and persecution. So Satan's first attack when you receive God's word is pressure. Now, how many of you ever been in church, you've been in one of Joseph's meetings and you heard a word, it was exactly what you needed to hear. You got excited about the word. You were so thankful for the word. And maybe later that day or the next day, some attack comes out of nowhere. He's like, man, I was so excited in church. I heard God, I knew it was God speaking to me. That word was just for me. And then all of a sudden something happened and this attack came. I don't know why the attack came. I'm going to tell you why the attack came. The attack came because of the word. That's what this parable teaches. That Satan comes for the word and he attacked to see if you would give up the word. 
to see if you would let go of the word that you heard because he does not want that word producing in your life. Even if you grabbed on for a little bit and it began to produce, he wants to turn up the pressure so intense that you let go of the word. And now when it scorches the uh, production away, it looks like you never received the word of God in the first place. But you have to make a decision to hold on no matter what the pressure applies. You have to be persistent in faith because that's what Jesus is looking for, for those who live during these times. He's looking for persistent faith and persistent faith does not give up when the pressure is applied. Persistent faith does not give up when pressure is applied. So say it this way, say, I don't give up in the face of pressure. Come on, say it out loud, put it in the chat. Say it like you believe it. Say, I don't give up in the face of pressure. Come on, say it out loud, put it in the chat. Say, I don't give up in the face of pressure. No, you don't, why? because you have persistent faith on the inside of you and that faith is growing right now. So, well, Pastor, how do you know it's growing? Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As this word keeps coming to your heart today, faith is growing in your heart. You must make a decision to believe the word and to receive it. That means hold on to it, no matter the pressure you're facing in your life. The next thing Jesus says that he called, compares these to thorns, these weeds that are growing up. He calls cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and desires or lust of other things. What is cares of this world? That is worry. That's anxiety. Deceitfulness of riches is simply lies and deception about money and wealth. Deceitfulness of riches or, uh, is being deceived by money or wealth. Now, you can be broke and be deceived by money. You can be rich and deceived by money. Deceived by money has nothing to do with your bank account. It really doesn't. Being deceived by money just means you believe lies about money. And so if you believe money is evil, then you believe a lie about money. So, well, how can you say that, Pastor? The scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil. That word love there means extreme avarice. And what is avarice? It means it's extreme greed. So extreme, extreme greed is the root of all evil, not money. Money is neither bad nor good. Money is neutral. It's how you use it that determines whether it's gonna have a good result or a bad result. So if you believe money is evil, you're deceived about money. If you believe money will solve all your problems, you are deceived about money. So deceitfulness of riches is one of the things Satan uses to crowd out or to choke the word or to keep the word from producing in your life. If you want to know more about how you can break free of that, I encourage you to read Joseph's book, Breaking Hell's Economy. Wonderful book that you need to read. It's going to encourage you and help you have more light about this issue. Number five, desires or lust of other things. So we've covered affliction, persecution, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, now lust or desires of other things. Now, this phrase means inordinate strong desires for other things. So let's say there's other things you want. It's not bad to want things. It's not. But when those desires get in the way of what God has called you to do, or those desires get in the way of what the Spirit of God is leading you to do or the path he has you on, whatever those desires are, even if those desires aren't necessarily wrong, but when those desires get in the way of what God is telling you to do, that desire would choke the word or stop the word from producing in your heart. Remember, the goal is for the word to produce 30 times, 60 times, 100 times in your life. So anytime God speaks to you, you get production that is on a multiply scale. So when you receive the word and you wonder why pressure throws your way, you wonder why this attack of worry or anxiety. You wonder why there's an attack of deceitfulness or riches or lust of other things. It's because Satan is trying to stop the word from working in your life. You are dangerous. You got to understand that. When you receive God's word, you allow faith to grow in your heart. You are dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. You are dangerous to hell's economy. You are dangerous to the powers of darkness. That's why you have to make a decision to persist in faith because God is looking for people who are persistent in faith in these times. It says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking on behalf for those he can show himself strong. God wants to show himself strong in your life. Come on, say it out loud, put it in the chat. Say, God wants to show himself strong in my life. Come on, say it out loud, put it in the chat. Say, God wants to show himself strong in my life. One more time, say it out loud, put it in the chat. Say, God wants to show himself strong in my life. Praise God. Let's keep going. Let's go to Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four. It's talking about how to have persistent faith the faith that Jesus is looking for in you and those who live in the end times. Hebrews chapter four, verse two. Hebrews chapter four, verse two. And if this is helping you so far, go ahead and put in the chat that is helping me, that is encouraging you. Hebrews chapter four, verse two. 
It says, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Now he's talking about those in the wilderness, children of Israel when they're in the wilderness. It says the word of God, the powerful word of God that you see later in Hebrews chapter four, which is sharper than any two-edged sword. This powerful word did not profit them or have any benefit in their life because they did not mix the word with faith. So that lets me know, even today, just like it says here, if we do not mix God's word with faith, the word won't profit us. If we don't mix God's word with faith, it won't profit us. So you say, well, how do I mix it? The words of your mouth or your tongue is how you mix God's word with your faith. The words of your mouth or your tongue is how you mix God's word with faith. You know, growing up, I really liked, you know, uh, Nestle's quick, especially the strawberry one, right? And so I'd have milk in the morning and I would take the bottle and I'd squeeze it in. But after I squeezed it in, I have the strawberry syrup in there and I have the milk, but it's not ready until I stir it. It's not ready until I mix it. It's not going to be enjoyable unless I stir it. It's not going to profit me or benefit me in the way I want it as a kid if I don't mix it. In the same way, when you hear God's word, you must make a decision to mix it. By you've heard it, now it's time for you to speak it. I like to say it this way. If your faith won't move your mouth, it won't move your mountain. If your faith won't move your mouth, your faith won't move your mountain. A lot of people want mountains in their life to be removed and cast into the sea. But if your faith can't get you to change the way you speak, your faith won't change that circumstance in your life. If your faith won't move your mouth, it won't move your mountain. So you must take the promises of God, the word of God that you hear, and you must let it affect the way you talk. You can tell what someone believes by just spending a little bit of time around them. Well, so how do you know that? Because if they're always talking about doubt and unbelief and how bad things are in the world and all the bad things going around them. If they always talk about the darkness, you can tell that they don't have faith to be the light in the world. Whatever you talk about is what you're impressed by. If you're always talking about the darkness, always talking about how bad things are, always talking about all the problems in your life, always talking about all the problems in your family, and that's all you talk about, you, you're showing what you're impressed by. Instead of talking about all the problems, talk about God's provision. Instead of talking about all the stuff coming at you, talk about the help of the Holy Spirit. Instead of talking about all the darkness in the world, talk about how God has called us to be the light. Because what God has for you, what he's put on the inside of your heart, what he's put in his word, what he's put in his church is more than enough to handle the darkness of the day. This darkness did not catch God by surprise. That's why he needs persistent faith in the earth. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Let's keep going down this stretch of what you need to do so that your faith becomes persistent, so that your faith is not a moment. Because faith is more than a moment, it's more than a movement, it's a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle that pleases God. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Notice what Paul tells Timothy. He says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you wage the good warfare. What, what did Paul tell Timothy? You take that prophetic word that's been spoken over you, that's been spoken to you, and you use that prophecy and you fight with it. You may say, well, how do I fight with a prophecy? You take the prophecy that you heard and you put it in your mouth. You take the prophecy you heard and you put it in your mouth. We're a part of Prophecy Live. We're part of this broadcast. And God speaks through Joseph so many different times, telling us things before it happens, encouraging us, giving us words to stand on and to believe. And some, some of us just listen to it and go, oh, that's great. Oh, I'm so God, glad God's going to do it. And that's all you do. No, no, no. When you hear things like that, you believe it, you write it down, and then you put it in your mouth. You start saying it every single day. Say, yep, I know this is going on in the world, but God's going to provide for me. Yep, I know this is happening over there, but God's got me. You need to take the prophetic word and put it in your mouth. And you put it in your wife mouth in two different ways. Well, how do you put it in your mouth? You put it in your mouth by what you say, your declarations, your affirmations, your confessions, you're speaking the word of God. You're retraining your mouth. So your mouth is not talking unbelief and doubt and fear and all the bad things in the world, speaking death, speaking evil things. No, you're retraining your mouth to speak words of life, words of faith, words of hope, words of love, words that are motivated by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you take the prophetic word and you put it in your mouth, but you also take the prophetic word 
and make it into a prayer assignment. I have a friend who says it this way. He says, if you don't, if the prophetic word spoken of you doesn't become a prayer assignment, he says, I doubt that you actually receive that prophetic word. You have to take that prophetic word that you hear, speak it out of your mouth and hold it before God in prayer. That when you go to prayer, says, Father, I thank you for what you said. It's coming to pass. You said this, that, and the other. You said this, that, and the other. I believe it and it's coming to pass in my life. And Father, I thank you for it. That's how you wage a good warfare by the prophetic word. It must come out through in your mouth through declarations, confessions, and affirmations, and it must come out in your prayer time. Now, something else about perfe- persistent faith. Persistent faith must be fueled. Persistent faith must be fueled. Go ahead, say out loud, put it in the chat, say persistent faith must be fueled. Come on, say out loud, put it in the chat, say persistent faith must be fueled. Say out loud, put it in the chat, say persistent faith must be fueled. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. The latter part of the verse is faith worketh by love. Faith which worketh by love. Or faith is made efficient by love. Faith works by love. Or we say this way, faith is fueled by love. Faith is made efficient by love. Now, we know some cars are more efficient than the others, and some cars will go farther depending on the type of gas that is in the tank and et cetera. And so if you want your faith to go the distance, if you want your persistent faith to go the distance, you need to have a high grade, high quality fuel. And the greatest quality of fuel is the love of God. Because, you know, anger is not a good fuel. Now, anger can cause some change. Sure it can. But if anger is the fuel of your life, you won't get that far. And if you keep that anger in you longer than 24 hours, as it tells in the scriptures, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. If you keep that anger in you, even if that anger is righteously motivated, right? If you let anger lead you, it will eventually destroy you and it won't get you that far. But if you let the love of God motivate you and you let the love of God fuel you, your faith will go the distance. Persistent faith must be fueled by love. Come on, say out loud, put in the chat, say persistent faith must be fueled by love. Persistent faith must be fueled by love. It has to. Now, well, what type of love? Here are two understandings of that. You must believe that God loves you and you must make a decision to walk in love, to live in love. You must make a decision to live by the commandment of love, that you believe that God loves you And you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you love others as you love yourself. Which lets you know you got to love yourself. Some people have a hard time loving others because they really don't love themselves. You have to love yourself. Did you know that? You really have to love yourself. Jesus loves you. So you might as well get in good company and love yourself. So many people can't fulfill the love command because they don't love themselves. The issue is they are loving others the way they love themselves. They don't see themselves the way God sees them, so they have a hard time loving themselves. But I'm telling you, if you begin to love yourself as the scripture tells you to, you'll be able to love others. But all that flows from your understanding and your belief in how much God loves you. Did you know in John 17, 23, when Jesus is praying, that he says this wonderful statement? And since I read that statement, I've held on to that statement. Jesus says that the Heavenly Father loves us as much as he loves Jesus. In John 17, 23, when Jesus is praying, he says this wonderful statement, a statement that once I read it and understood, I've held on to it every single day. In this statement, he reveals a, a powerful truth that you need to know if you're going to have persistent faith in the end times. He's praying and he says in John 17, 23, that God loves us as much as he loves Jesus. Let that sink in. The heavenly father, God himself, loves you as much as he loves Jesus, the son of God. You might say, of course he loves Jesus. Jesus is perfect. Jesus never sinned. Jesus came for us. He died on the cross. God raised him from the dead. He's ascended to the right hand of God. He sits there now. Yes, that's true. God loves Jesus. Yes, Jesus is perfect, was perfect, always will be perfect. And yet Jesus said that God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. When you understand how much God loves you, it will fuel your faith. And once you understand how much God loves you, it will enable you to love others because you truly love yourself. When you really believe how much God loves you, you will actually love yourself correctly and you'll be able to love others correctly. Because that love, as it says elsewhere in scripture, that love is poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of love himself pours his love 
in us. And when we make a decision to believe that love, that love fuels our faith. And you want also one of the things we learned from first John, that love evicts, cast out, flushes out fear because fear has torment. And he that's afraid or that fears is not made mature or complete in love. So the more you believe that God loves you, fear flees. Fear has no root in you when you believe that God loves you. You're able to step out in faith and do the impossible because you know how much God loves you. That's why we say that persistent faith must be fueled by the love of God. You must make a decision to love others and you must believe that God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. I know that shocks a lot of religious notions out there. Think, oh God, I don't know how God can love me that way. And that's one of the reasons why people's faith is challenged so much. You must believe that God loves you. So let's Put a pin in here right now and say it out loud. Put it in the chat. Say, God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. Come on, say it out loud. Put it in the chat. Say, God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. Come on, say it out loud. Put it in the chat. Say, God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. He really does. God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Let's say it one more time. Bonus time. Say, God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. Praise God. Let's keep going. Run out of time. We're talking about how to have persistent faith. So we said your persistent faith must be fueled, but your persistent faith also must be charged. Jude one twenty says, but you beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. That phrase build up. If we would use that phrase in the Greek today, we're talking about charging. You know, before I can use any of my devices today, I have to charge them. Why? Because if I don't, they're just paperweights. They're no good to me. Your faith has to be fueled and your faith has to be charged. And you charge your faith by spending time praying in the spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's how you charge your faith, praying in the spirit, praying in other tongues. As 1 Corinthians 14 says, praying out those mysteries, praying out those words the Holy Spirit gives in your heart. The more time you spend praying in the spirit, the more your faith will be charged. Your faith must be fueled. Your faith must be charged. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and begin to bring this home. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Like I said, I had a lot of notes for you today, a lot of scriptures. All of these notes and scriptures can be found at carrickbutler.com. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We say this way, your faith gives your hope substance. Your faith gives your hope substance. One more time. Your faith gives your hope substance. It is the evidence or the title deed of things you don't see. Persistent faith must be paired with hope. Persistent faith must be paired with hope if you want your persistent faith to go the distance. Persistent faith must be paired with hope. Faith, I say this way, faith is like the raw materials. Hope is the blueprint. Faith is like the raw materials. Faith is like the blueprints. We have to be faith people and we must be hope people. Hope is simply defined as positive expectation. Hope is defined as having a positive expectation. Yes, I know we live in the end times. Yes, I know all the bad things are going on. Yes, I know the darkness that's in the world. Yes, I know all these different things. But the thing is you must choose hope. You must choose to have a positive expectation for your life. You must expect that something good is going to happen to you today. You must expect that God's going to show up and show out in your life if you want your faith to work. Because a lot of people have developed their faith, but their faith doesn't do much for them because they have no hope. It's possible to have faith and not hope. It's possible to have faith and be on low levels of hope or even be in despair. And despair is just evil. Hope. What is evil hope when you expect bad things? So while I live in the end times, bad things have to happen to me. No, 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 no. Yes, bad things have happen around you, but it doesn't mean it has to happen to you. You dwell in Goshen. You dwell in Psalms 91. You dwell in the secret place of the Most High God. You abide under the shadow of El Shaddai. You abide in the shadow of the Almighty God. You've said of him, he is your refuge. He is your fortune. He is your God. And him do you trust. Remember what it says in Psalm 91? That you'll only be a spectator. That you'll see these things, but because you dwell in the secret place, you're just a spectator. Just because it happens in the world does not mean it has to happen in your house. Come on, say it aloud. Say, not my house. Just because things are going on 
around the world does not mean it has to happen in your house. You are the redeemed. And it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You are redeemed and delivered from the authority and the power of darkness. You've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. That blood separates you from all the Satan's trying to do. So the thing is, you have to make a decision. It's like, you know what? I'm not allowing that in my house. I'm not allowing that in my life. I make my stand of faith. I'll be persistent in faith and I'm going to fight the good fight of faith and I'm going to resist the devil. And guess what? If I'm submitted to God, I resist the devil. The devil must flee from me. That's the type of faith that you're going to need to win in these days. You can't just let bad things happen. You can't just say, oh, bad things come in threes. You can't keep saying mess like that. You have to start saying what the word of God says if you want the word to work for you. You must be a hope person. You must choose to believe. You must choose to have hope. Another way we would say today, you must choose to dream big. You must be a big dreamer. God needs big dreamers in these days. Those who would dare to dream big so that God can produce his vision, his plan in their life. Because there's so many people who dream too small, who think too small, but there's so much work to be done in these end times. God needs people who would dream big, hope big, believe big, not because of what goes on in the world, but because they know God, they know his word, they know his character, and that they know that he loves them as much as he loves Jesus. Let me read this scripture to you, Psalm 27, 13 and 14. It says, I would have lost heart or I would have fainted unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Notice what the psalmist says, I would have given up. I would have quit if I did not believe that I would see God's goodness in the land of the living. That word goodness in the Hebrew is defined as prosperity, good things, property, supply, provision, good in the widest sense of the word, and good to the farthest extreme. Verse 14 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That word wait does not mean do nothing and sit down, just wait for something to happen. That word wait paints the picture of you leaning in in expectation, that you expect God to show up and show out. It's just like if you are at a bus stop and you know the bus that you were waiting for is coming down the street and you see people lean in because they know they're about to get on that bus. You're leaning in. That's what the word wait is. You're leaning into God because you know he hasn't forgotten you. You know he's not going to leave you. You know he's going to show up. You know he's going to show out. You know he's going to perform his word. So you're not in despair. You're not in evil hope. You're expecting good things. You're leaning in. And as you believe, you'll see the goodness of God in the land of living. As you leave in, lean in, he will strengthen your heart and your faith will go the distance. Come on, say out loud. Say, I expect good things. Come on, say out loud. Put in the chat. Say, I expect good things. Come on, say out loud. Put in the chat. Say, I expect good things. Something good is going to happen to you. So you need to expect miracles. Praise God. Romans 15, 13. Notice what Paul prays and what I'm praying for you. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound or overflow in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't want you to have a little hope. He wants you to overflow in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to be have persistent faith, you need to have hope that's overflowing so you can do everything that God has called you to do in these times. What that is, what does that produce in our life? Hebrews 6, 12 says that you do not become sluggish or lazy, but imitate or follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. So where patience is cheerful endurance. Faith and cheerful endurance combined is persistent faith. And in today's time together, I showed you how to persistent faith. Persistent faith always receives the promises. Persistent faith always receives the miracle. Persistent faith it's always met by the power of God. And I know there's so many of you believing for things today. And I believe that the anointing that I sense right now, the anointing that you sense in your house is flowing to minister to your needs right now. So Father, I pray over every single person. I release your healing power to flow through their lives. Yep, that person that has that issue in their lower back, be healed in the name of Jesus. Someone's neck is being healed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. We speak to bones, to men, to be whole. We speak to, yes, we speak to the spine, be made whole, be healed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Organs are being touched right now. Someone's spleen is being touched right now by the power of God. There are, yes, intestines are being healed right now. There are things that are being touched by the power of God right now. 
gallbladder issues are being healed right now in the name of Jesus. Lungs, lungs be healed. Receive the breath of God. Some of you have lung type issues, asthma type issues, some type of issues with your breathing. Take a deep breath and breathe out and you'll see that he's already touching your lungs. The healer is in the house because Jesus is the healer and he's healing you right now. So Father, I pray for the power of God to flow from the top of the head to the soles of the feet, bringing a healing, bringing a cure, causing miracles to happen in their body in the name of Jesus. I pray for miracles to happen in their finances, miracles to happen in their relationships, miracles to happen in their businesses, miracles to happen in their ministries, miracles to happen in their life. We release the supernatural, miraculous power of God to flow in their lives right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we take authority over all the plans of darkness, of all the things Satan has arrayed against them. We bind you in the name of Jesus. We hold the blood of Jesus against you or we curse all of those demonic plans to fail. They are the people of God. They're washed in the blood and they will accomplish everything, every single thing God has called them to accomplish in Jesus name. Ooh, that healing power is working. That miracle power is working. Come on, say out loud, say I receive it. That healing power is working through your body right now. It's calling healing. It's causing a cure. Go ahead and do what you couldn't do. Whether you had issues with your back or your neck, begin to move it. You'll see the power of God is already working in your life. And if you already sense it, already sense the difference in your body, go ahead and testify in the chat what God has done for you so other people can be encouraged as well. I'm telling you, something just changed. Something just shifted. The power of God is working in your life. And so when you leave this broadcast today, you need to start talking like it. You need to start saying that something good is going to happen to me. I expect miracles. God's going to show up and show out in my life that God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. Put your faith to work by the words of your mouth. I love you all so much. Before I go, I want to share with you about a book that you should read during this Christmas season. It's called Jesus, Son of Rahab. It's a restorative devotional for the canceled and disqualified. Uh, I'm so honored that Joseph Z endorsed the book. It's an Advent devotional for people to read through December, from December 1st to 24th. Early this year, it wasn't even Christmas time, and hit number one on different charts on Amazon. So you can order it from Amazon. You can order it from my website. But I'm telling you that it's going to help you walk into the future God has for you. So if you ever felt canceled or disqualified, it's going to remind you that God has a plan and purpose for your life. By the way, someone's shoulder just got healed. Go ahead and move your shoulder. You see the healing power is working in you right now. So if you want to get that book, Jesus, Son of Rahab, a restorative devotional for the canceled and disqualified, it's available on Amazon. It's also available if you go to my website at carrickbutler.com. Once again, thank you for tuning in today. Joseph and Heather, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. They're celebrating getting ready for their daughter's wedding and partners. They wanted to, to let you know how much they love you, how much they appreciate you. They can't do what they do in this ministry without you. They appreciate your prayers. They appreciate your financial support. And if you've been blessed by this ministry and wondering if this is good ground that you should partner with, I'm telling you, it's good ground. So if you've been wondering about if you should be a partner, don't wonder anymore. Become a partner with this wonderful ministry. So partners, Thank you so much. We love you so much. Joseph and Heather, thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity. I'm Carrick Butler. I'm so glad that you joined me today. Know that something good is going to happen to you. Expect miracles. I'll see you next time. God bless. Have you noticed the collision of good and evil, light versus darkness? It's happening every day right in front of us. I'm Joseph Z, and I just wrote this book, Breaking Hell's Economy. It's a prophetic book dealing with this exact issue. What we're facing right now is a collision of kingdoms. It's the kingdom of darkness versus God's kingdom. It's the kingdom of light versus the gates of hell. And what you're seeing is this collision taking place, but we are promised that the church, the called out ones, would overcome and we would never be taken over by the gates of hell. In the times we're living in, you can see incredible, outstanding breakthrough in every area of your life. Much like the children of Israel that went through the darkness and shined as a light in Goshen in the middle of difficulty. This book is a prophetic book for you and your family to thrive in the middle of difficult times. You know, there's nothing new under the sun, and that's what we're seeing over and over again is this challenge. You've seen the Great Depression back in the 20s and 30s. You've seen wars and world wars and many things that have come against society, and this pattern repeats itself. And I'm here to tell you today, even Jesus dealt with the same issue that we're facing today when he was a child. 
Many people have been through this before, and the outcome determines what you believe. What you believe and what you know will bring a great outcome for you. And this book is a prophetic book that will help you navigate and break out of this present evil age. Get ready to be the light in darkness. Get ready to be the light in Goshen that God has called you to be. Breaking Hell's Economy is for you. I encourage you to order your copy today. Recently, we've seen a dramatic increase in partnership in this ministry. And I want to talk to you about it just very briefly. And the reason is, is because every day we go live or we're broadcasting and there are people who pretend to be us or there's different ways people are contacted. And I simply want to give you the safe and clear route for how to become a partner and stand with this ministry. Number one, you only go to Joseph Z dot com to become a partner. Secondly, you can text that keyword give to 719-259-0029. The reason I bring this up is because partners are such a vital part of this ministry. And when you become a partner, first of all, you're going to hear from us. We're going to call you. We're going to celebrate with you and we'll be praying with you all the time. As a matter of fact, we have quite an interaction going with our partner family. And if you want to do that today, we welcome you. Welcome to the family if you want to do it today. I encourage you to pray about it because I believe the Lord is calling God-appointed people to stand with this ministry. You can also simply give a one-time gift, stand with the ministry. All of the information for doing so is available at josephz.com or right here on the screen. And I want to encourage you to do so. Our team will call you, they will stand with you, and they will be praying over you. I simply wanted to say this today because we are looking forward to building so many more avenues of reaching people. Remember, we're calling it a million to reach a billion. Help us raise up a million clear-eyed, clear-minded reformers to reach a billion for the kingdom of God. Please consider becoming a partner today. We would just love to welcome you to our partner family. Let's go win the world together for Jesus. We are living in a last days culture, and you've got to understand something. Both God and the kingdom of darkness are territorial, and you are the hinge pin. You are absolutely the emissary, the free moral agent of permission to give access to light or darkness. I'm Joseph Z, and I recently had the Spirit of the Lord speak to me to write this book, Servants of Fire. It is a last days prayer intercession and prophecy manual for how to rise up, activate the forces of heaven to work on your behalf. We go into so many things in this book that I know God spoke to me about from his word that's going to greatly impact you and take you forward. The world is crazy. Things are getting wild, but you can overcome with the spiritual forces of heaven right from the manual that's written in this book. We go into everything from dealing with strange encounters, wicked spirits, how to push back authorities that are of dominion of evil and take territory in Jesus. I got to tell you, this book is a must have for your library, a must have. It will navigate you right through these difficult days and you will see victory. You will see results. Did you know most Christians, most believers have everything they need. All they need is a revelation of what they have. And this book will provide that for you. You need it. I'm telling you, it's a now word, a revelation. I'm Joseph Z. I hope you pick up Servants of Fire for your future and your benefit today.